All right, we are going live here and uh, we just made it in time. I had some technical issues on my end, but we got it worked out here. And it looks like I'm going live there and I'm looking over at my computer. Looks like things are looking good over there. Wonderful. Welcome, my name is Sean McVay with Sean's Outdoor Adventures. And this is my weekly live show that I'm doing in partnership with Bowtech. I'm very excited to have you tuning in. I appreciate that. And um, if you are new to tuning into this live broadcast, a couple things I want to tell you, and I'll probably mention it again because it generally takes a couple minutes for people to get logged on, and I'll also do a couple shout outs. I like to do this on, I have my YouTube channel pulled up here, and it looks like we got a couple people signing on. Daniel, how are you? Jerry, nice to see you. Mr. Sir, what's up? Uh, see Jerry's name on there a couple times. So one thing I want to mention is this broadcast is going out in a lot of locations. So it's going on my YouTube channel, Sean's Outdoor Adventures, but it's also going out through a lot of Botex um, different avenues. So Botex website, their Facebook page, their YouTube channel, Diamond, all those types of things. And my computer's making noises here. So this is going everywhere, but as you can see, I am a one-man show. So I like to entertain questions near the end. And what I ask is, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a question that you'd like me to address, I ask you to go to my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel because that's the only place I'm monitoring. There's only so much I can do as a one-man show. So go there for any questions you might want to ask me in this live feed and do them there. But I'll also say this, um, I'm not gonna be watching the computer screen while I'm giving my little presentation. So as I get near the end of the information I wanna share tonight, I'll say, okay, everybody, now's the time to start putting up your questions. And that way I will be able to find them because they'll be at the bottom of the live feed here. And if you ask a question like in two minutes, it's gonna get buried in comments because people you know, are, are writing stuff throughout the presentation, things like that, and I'm not gonna be able to find it very easily. So when I ask for the questions, that's when you put it up. It'll be at the bottom of the feed. I'll be able to see it real easy. And make sure you put a question mark at the end of the sentence. It just helps that sentence pop out so I know here's a question because not everything that's gonna be written there is gonna be a question. I'm gonna to have to be sifting through it real quickly. Uh, give a couple more shout outs here. I think there's some more people signing on. Michael, how are you? Uh, John, Gibson, Kyle, all you guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Kyle just found my channel. And uh, thanks, he thinks I have the best advice out there. So good, thank you. Um, so tonight's topic is um, how to gain permission or how to ask for permission to hunt on someone's property. I think this is an important topic to address because I think there's a lot of guys out there who uh, or girls who maybe don't approach it the best way they could and so they kind of hurt their chances. So I just want to um, throw a few ideas out there and a couple more sh shout outs. Here's Jeff from Kentucky. Travis, how are you? He shoots a diamond and loves it. Um, so, and here's one other thing. Before I get into the meat of the content tonight, I want to check out this. I, I get contacted by a lot of companies asking me if I will you know, do a review on their product and stuff like this. This is an Olight headlamp, and they asked me to do it, and I agreed to it, but I'm kind of in the process of changing my approach to doing all this. I'm not gonna just freely do these anymore. So this is gonna be kind of near the end. I have a few more things coming in that I said I would look at. I don't have any time this week at all to do this, so um, I just told these people I would open it up real quick and look at it. So this is a headlamp, and I like to walk in when I'm hunting with a headlamp, so that's one of the reasons I told him I'd check it out because I kind of need a new one. So it, um, okay, there's, let's see, I don't want to blare you. So there's, looks like there's two brightness settings, a bright and a low. It's kind of neat how it, um, you know, fades in and out. The battery pack is chargeable on the back. So I'm actually going to be using this. I'm going to start my hunting this weekend, which is like I needed a headlamp and they asked me. So I'm like, all right, I'll take a look at it. Um, and it's actually pretty nice. I was just peeking at it a minute ago before we went live just to make sure I knew what I was doing with it. But, um, you know, so I'll try to get some information if you guys want to check that out. But it's, it's a pretty nice headlamp and it's, it's very lightweight. And I think this is 
uh, pretty solid construction. So thank you, Olight people. Um, and in the future, I will probably not be doing any box openings on these live feeds, but I just, I didn't want to leave them hanging and I'm not going to be able to get to it this week. All right. So getting to the meat of things, let's get into talking about gaining permission. And um, I'm going to go over to my little uh, whiteboard over here to help get this. And let me get this up a little bit so you can see everything. Uh, where is my marker? Here it is. So I kind of have it broken up into a couple different categories as far as when it comes to asking for permission. And the first part we're going to look at is before you ask permission, I'll go over the four. During the, the process of talking to the person, after you gain permission, and then after after. That would be after the season's over. So um, actually I put a couple things on a note here. I'm just going to kind of I have this here to try to make sure I don't forget anything because there's a lot of stuff I want to mention to you. And again, if you're just tuning in, please save your questions. And if you have questions about the map reading challenge, um, I will try to address those later, but we are not doing all the voting and everything yet. And those of you who know about the free BOTAC that's going to be given away to one of the contestants on the map reading challenge and one of the viewers, I will try to remember to address that at the end. So we'll, we'll do that later. And again, save your questions toward the end, use a question mark when you're asking it, and go to my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube page to ask the question. Okay, so let's talk about when you wanna ask permission. And if you think about this in human nature, it's a lot of us get a little bit nervous when we have to go and talk to someone that we've never talked to before. And um, that can be expected. So. There's a lot of people out there that chew tobacco and um, and smoke cigarettes and stuff. And when they get nervous, that's when they go for those things. But so before you even get there, I'm going to encourage you don't use those products. So I don't want you to go up to the person's house smelling like a freshly lit cigarette. Um, I don't want you having a bunch of chew in your mouth and a spit cup because I mean you never know the type of personality person you're going to encounter there. So if you're walking up with your spitter, you know, and a bunch of chew in your mouth and you're spitting, you might really gross somebody out, especially if it's like an older lady who's kind of proper and she's the landowner, you're really hurting your chances. So uh, let's write a couple things on the before. Um, I wanna say even before that, let's talk about clothing. I intentionally wore this shirt for this tonight. This is a somewhat nice shirt. Let me write, write clothing. So this is a somewhat nice shirt, but it's not overkill. I'm not like in a shirt and tie or a suit. And as you can see, I'm a, I'm a religious person, but you also have to think about that in the context of our culture. Um, there's a lot of people that go door to door knocking on, on people's door, you know, proselytizing and trying to, you know, share their religion. And very often they're dressed up in a white shirt and a tie. And um, there's a lot of people who get a little turned off by that. And I, I mean, I admire their efforts, but at the same time, what we're trying to accomplish here is we're trying to get our foot in the door. If somebody is turned off by that. We don't want to look. So I don't go overkill in dressing up. I don't wear a shirt and tie. Um, I'll wear something like here's, this is sort of a middle of the road. It's sort of like a golf shirt style, you know, it has a button, you know, button or two right here, a collar. Uh, it's a little bit kind of looks nice, but it's not real nice. And so this is going to be good for a large audience. So if I'm walking up to a farmer who's muddy and just that's his living, I'm not in a shirt, a shirt and tie. So I'm not creating a big barrier. Like this is a shirt. I don't mind if it gets dirt, dirty. And, um, so I'm not creating a huge barrier there, but then if I go and knock on a door where you have that real proper person who's, you know, you know, they're a little bit cleaner about everything and they, they don't want to have a, you know, somebody looking dirty at their door. Um, this is a good middle of the road. So I can kind of get my foot in the door with both of those people. So when you're thinking about going to ask permission, think about what you're going to wear. And I encourage you to pick something that's sort of somewhat nice, 
but not overkill. And also, you know, like I wouldn't mind getting this dirty if I had to, if I had to pick up something to help that farmer right there in the parking lot or whatever. But I also wouldn't feel like underdressed totally if I was walking on some, knocking on someone's door who answered, who was wearing a suit just after church or church. Well, yeah, church or uh, work. So think about your clothing, go for that middle road. That's my suggestion. Um, so another thing I would actually say, and this is, just think about this. Let's talk about our teeth for a minute. Oops. So think about your teeth. And really what I mean is your breath. Um, we're all human. And, and, you know, sometimes, depending on the type of person that you're talking to, they might be like, oh, gosh, this person has really bad breath. And, and they don't really want to stay in the conversation. You don't want to put yourself in that situation. So I love... Honestly, people, I brush my teeth and use mouthwash before I go knocking on doors because um, I, I think that helps my breath stay fresh. Also, if you go for a long period of time without eating, it actually starts to give you bad breath. Um, I don't know the, the whole biology of it, but I'm sure there's like certain reasons that your body starts to emit certain things when it's hungry, whatever. So eat a decent meal before you go because then you're not distracted by hunger anyway, but um, that's another thing. And I also encourage you to not chew gum while you're talking to somebody. You know, you don't want them to be like offended or annoyed because you're so chomping on the gum or you're hard to understand because you're chomping on the gum. Again, this might seem like um, t total common sense to some people, but you would be surprised of the number of people who wouldn't even think of these things. And so they're kind of hurting their chances a little bit, which is why I'm mentioning it. So um, we're going to be decent. We're going to, but, and also, you know, there's breath mints out there, but I, I've used breath mints in my life and my, my breath while I was using the mint was fine. Uh, but afterwards it just went downhill fast. So that's why I'm not encouraging you to use those either. You don't want the mint in your mouth while you're talking. Cause that can just be distracting. But then also if depending on how long the conversation goes, your breath could go downhill and the person could get a little bit again, you're dealing with human beings and certain things can set people off and you just want to give yourself the best chance. Um, so I mentioned like, um, you know, no tobacco, like no smoking, things like that. You want to avoid that. Let's see, you look on my thing here. Here's another thing to do. When you pull into someone's driveway, try to not block any cars. So let's just write parking. So if you pull into a, a, someone's property and, um, you know, there's a bunch of cars there, picture this for a minute. You go in and you're like, all right, well, I'll just park behind this car. You get into a conversation with the gentleman who owns the land, who has some teenage children. One of them decides, oh, I got to go meet with my friends, so I'm going to go drive there. And your car is blocking the way. So now you have to go get in your car, back out of the driveway, let the person out. In the meantime, maybe the guy gets a phone call. Imagine if you're standing there talking to him and none of that happens and he's getting a phone call. He might just take his phone off and be like, you know what, I'll take the call later and he'll keep, you know, talking to you. But if you're in the car backing up and whatever and then he takes the call and then he gets to chatting with whoever it is, you know, you might just ruin your conversation there and cut it short because now, you know, he's into the conversation. He might be like, well, I'll have to get back to you later and go. he goes in the house. So... The whole point is even be strategic when you pull in the driveway and look for a clear spot to park where you're not going to block anybody if that's possible. Or even just if you're allowed to park on the street, park on the street where you're, you know, you're not going to be in anybody's way. Okay, so um, here's the last thing I would say in the before. Be prepared to chat. Be prepared to stay be in that conversation for a half hour or whatever it takes so when you're planning out your day to go talk to some landowner to see if you can get permission don't go like oh i got five minutes i'll go knock on this guy's door real quick because if if you knock on someone's door well let me give you an example um i was actually hunting in new york one year and it was public land and i'm studying the maps i always sit there in the in the tree stand studying my maps and um as I'm studying the maps, I'm like, you know what? It's so far to hike to get to the back end of this public land, but there's a property on the other side. If I could get permission to park there and walk in, that would be awesome. So um, after I got down out of the tree stand after the morning hunt, I always have a change of clothes. I changed out, I took all my camo off. Again, 
Think about your clothing. You don't really want to show up at someone's door in full camo. It just doesn't send the right message. You know what I mean? You just, you want to get a rapport with the person. And so I changed into my normal clothes that I had with me because I was doing a couple overnights up there. I drove over and I knocked on the guy's door. Um, no answer. I was getting ready to walk back to the car and then I heard a dog barking behind the house. So I just hung out for a minute. Dog came running around. I figured, okay, let's see if anybody shows up here. The dog is sending a message that something's up. And eventually a guy came walking around the house. The guy had gotten injured at work, broke his collarbone or something like that, and had been out of work for, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. The guy was going crazy just at his house all day long. It was, you know, getting near November. It was pretty cold outside that day, and he had a pond out back. He was fishing in his pond, you know, with numb fingers just because he was bored. So here I am. I just said, you know, I introduced myself. And here's another thing I would say that's important when you are knocking on a door. And let me throw this in too because I forgot to mention it. But when I knock on the door, like if you are the landowner's door, I'll knock on the door and then I'll turn and face away. And I will wait for the person to come. One thing you don't want to do is be creepy and be like looking in the door and waiting for the person to come. It just doesn't send a good message. So if you knock on the door and turn, it just, the person doesn't feel like there's an intrusion that you're just, you're, you're giving them space. Um, I'm here. I'm ready. If you want to come out and talk, that kind of thing. So anyway, in this situation, I was actually standing in that position. I was facing back toward the driveway. The guy came around the house. I began to talk to him. And he, like I was saying, he was just going out of his mind because he was off of work for so long and he was just home all day. So I sat and talked to the guy for about an hour and a half. And then I was like, well, listen, I got to go. I got to get in the stand for an evening hunt. But my point is, when you go to someone's house, you know, if you're trying to gain permission, be ready to chat. Some people, you might even knock on an old person's door who has nobody to talk to. And you'll make their day just by being there to talk. So... Be ready with your time and also that's an important thing when you knock on the door I encourage you to, to turn and face the other way so let's see what else okay now let's say you're in the conversation now and by the way I'm gonna just mention this in that situation I was simply asking for permission to access the public land through his property you know I, I was just like listen I mean the, the borderline is right here I don't want to cause any trouble. I, it would be just great if I could park and just slip up the edge into the public land. And the guy owned, um, I think it was somewhere around 50 to 90 acres. I can't remember the exact amount now. By the end of the conversation, he gave me permission to hunt his whole land. He's like, I don't hunt anymore. Nobody else hunts it. Um, you're welcome to it. And so um, you could even go with that angle sometimes like if you let's say you're looking to access public land or different property and where your stand location is it you know it just would be so much better if you could access it from the other side that could be a doorway for an extra property on your list so like you you know you go and knock on that person's door you introduce yourself and say listen i don't want to interrupt you i'm i'm sorry i have permission to hunt on the neighbor's property and the location I wanted to try, it's just really hard to get to without interfering everything from their, from their driveway. W would it be possible if I parked here and just slipped in the back? And, you know, they might give you permission, they might not. You might gain an extra property, though. And here's an important thing that I want to say, too, that, that just came to my mind um, in the before or... Actually, this is... Here I, here I am. Let's go during. Um Share. Share the information you want before you ask for it. This is something I've developed a long time ago, not just in this type of thing, but in life. It really helps to ease people. Like if you go in there and you're like, hey, can I hunt your property or this or that, and you're just asking questions, people can feel a little interrogated. And so in order to diffuse that, I always offer information usually on the topic that I want to gain, you know, or information on. So if I want to learn the person's name, I'll say, hi, my name is Sean McVeigh and I'm, you know, here for this and that and the other thing. I just want to introduce myself and, you know, like to get to know you or whatever. And if they offer their name, that's, well, hopefully that's what they'll do. And I also want to throw this in there because um, this came up. 
Corey Cohen, uh, one of the guys from the Map Reading Challenge, he knew that I was going to be talking on this topic tonight, and he sent me an article the other day um, on this topic. And so, like, about a half hour before I went live, I just pulled it up just to see what it had to say. And the number two suggestion on there was to find out the landowner's name before you go there, do your homework, and then be sure to use it uh, right when you get there. And I thought, man, that's actually a really bad idea, in my opinion. Now, I'm a father of four kids, and my job is to protect them, and my property is like our safe dwelling. So if someone comes to my door and says, Hi, Sean McVeigh. Uh, my name is whatever, blah, blah. The fact that this person has my name before I have any clue who they are is a, like a, that's a concern to me. But like, is this person stalking me? And I mean, it might sound funny, but it's legitimate people. When people want to protect their family, their home is their safe place. And so if, if they get a feeling right off the bat that you're like researching them, that could just really turn them off. I know it would turn me off right away. And I would want that person out of there as quickly as they came. So um, I would not recommend that. I would say the only time you, you use the name is if you gain it from them because it's they offered it. You didn't you know go behind their back or anything to get it. So um, when I knock on the door, Hi, my name is Sean McVeigh. I live, et cetera, et cetera, because I want them to know where I live so it, it eases up. Because right now, I'm on their property. They don't know who I am. They don't know where I'm coming from, so I want to give them that. And um, that's really important to help you know calm people down so where they're a little more open in general. So um, after, after any time I'm going for information, I like to offer it first. And... I also think it's good in that whole thing to allow yourself to be a little vulnerable. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're nervous to go ask for permission, it's okay to tell the person that because it helps them feel like, okay, you're human too. You're not, you know, this isn't easy for you either, you know? So like I'll say, hi, my name's Sean McVeigh. I live right down the road about two miles on, um, maybe mention the name of my road. Um, been living here for about 10 years and um, this is really kind of hard for me. I'm a little nervous right now, but I came here today to see if it was at all possible to gain permission to bow hunt on your property and um, you know, that's really what I'm after. So, you know, and I try to just open the conversation, but I throw in there that uh, this isn't easy for me and I'm a little bit nervous. And if somebody hears that, it helps to calm them down. So don't be afraid to be a little vulnerable in that regard. And that can, you know, go a long way with, with people who normally would be, uh, like, especially your older people or women. Like, if you're a guy and you come to the door and there's a woman there, I mean, you know, who's this guy on my door? This is a little bit of a concerning situation. But if you would say, hey, I'm a little nervous about being here. This isn't my normal thing. I'm just trying to find a place to go hunting this fall. I mean, those types of statements can, can ease people a little bit. So, um, let's see what else. All right, let's say you're, um, you're talking to the person and they're a little bit on the fence. Like, they're standing there going, well, you know, I'm not sure. One of the things that, especially men in our culture, and I'm in the United States, and, and it could be other cultures as well, is a lot of times we try to always fix things. We just immediately say, well, you know, if the person's a little on the fence, we'll start saying, well, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, uh, you know, and we're trying to provide a solution when maybe we don't even know the real reason why they're on the fence. So I would suggest if the person's a little on the fence, Ask an open question, something like, well, is there anything in particular that causes you to be a little unsure about letting somebody on your property to bow hunt? And see what they say. You could be totally surprised by the answer. You know, you might have been thinking, oh, I'll tell them I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do the other thing. And the real reason's way over here, you know. And so, you know, let's say uh, you're talking to a woman and she's like, well, my ex-boyfriend who dumped me two years ago used to bow hunt here and I've been afraid to let anybody on, anybody on in case he ever comes back. And, you know, if he comes back, I want him to be allowed to hunt here. And in my response would be that I totally understand that. First of all, I'm sorry that you went through the breakup. And what I just, that statement right there, folks, is 
you're acknowledging that they might have hurt feelings there and you're trying to care about them. It's you're making an effort to see, okay, this person's been hurt. Let me put my agenda aside of trying to get permission and just acknowledge that for a moment. So yeah, I'm sorry that that happened. Um, but let me ask you if, um, you know, if, ev if everything else was okay and you did let me hunt here and he did come back, I would have no problem just not coming back, you know, total, leave total room for him and I would just totally get out of the way. Is that something that, you know, might help ease your mind on the thing? And maybe she'd be like, you know what, yeah, because um, now she's able to let you in and hunt there and you're also very aware that if something was to happen in her relationship that she wishes worked out, um, you're out of the way. And, you know, maybe that person won't come back and you'll be able to hunt there for five years, whatever. My point is, you know, try to be a little caring for the person, but at the same time, don't just offer a solution if they're on the fence. Try to ask a question that might help you understand what the issue is so that then you can come up with a solution. So ask the question before giving the solution. So let's just say ask. Ask before offering a solution. And another thing too, um, if the person's a little bit on the fence, I personally am a bow hunter only. I mean, I, I've i never even shot a deer with a gun. <laughs> the only thing I've ever shot with a gun uh, was a black bear. And it was, I mean, that whole crazy story is, it's in my book here, Becoming a World Class Hunter. Um, but it was just, I was, it was a weird situation. I'm not going to get into it because I'll just get off track. But I don't gun hunt is the point. And so when I'm asking for permission, permission, it's bow hunting only. And there has been a lot of times where I have gotten permission to hunt a property and I'm the only one who's hunting it during archery season. So the landowner said to me, you can hunt all you want in archery, but when gun season opens, it's me only, and me, me and my family only. So these were gun hunters, not bow hunters. And they maybe they figured, hey, this is a nice guy. Um, and like the one guy actually said, you know, I was in New York asking for mission and I'm from Pennsylvania. He's like, you know, you Pennsylvania guys are great. You know, people in New York, they just sneak on my land all the time. It really upsets me. But every time I've ever had someone knock on the door asking for permission, they were from Pennsylvania. I'm like, hey, awesome, you know. But the point was he was he appreciated me asking and not just trying to sneak on. And so he's like, you just call me first and let me know you're coming. And if there's ever any issue, I'll let you know, which there never was, by the way. And I did kill a buck on his property, right? Or actually, it was on the, it was on the state land right behind his property. So I never even actually hunted on his property. I, I just walked through it to the state land, and I killed a buck there. Um, but the point was, you know, I, I respected, I asked the question, and I also emphasized archery only. And so I got in there all throughout archery season without any issues. Um, and here's another thing. Now, once you kind of gain that permission, or even if they're on the fence a little bit, um, you can just offer your, your help. And um, again, we don't want to approach with the, with the mentality like, I just want this for me. I mean, I want permission here for me. Get rid of that right away and say, this is an opportunity to have some form of a relationship with a person, meaning some form of communication that I could be in touch with this person in the big picture of things. I can care about this person. And so um, I've always offered, is there, if you ever need any help with anything, just let me know, I, I'd be willing to help. Sometimes there's old people who need someone to trim their bushes, you know? And what I would suggest to you is, is do that, but have a date. Have a date in mind before you go asking um, permission to hunt on people's land. So say, okay, look at your calendar. When am I available to give someone a day of work? And now when you're talking to the person, be like, you know what? I was looking at my calendar before I was, before I came here. And um, I have, I'll just make up a date. I have September 30th wide open from like noon to four. If you want, I would love to come and help out around here. If there's anything you want or need help with, 
just let me know. I mean, I'm willing to do that. You know, we can schedule it right now. And the reason why I say just have a date is because you don't want to leave it too open-ended. Um, let's say they do periodically call you in the next couple weeks saying, hey, I need help with this, I need help with that. If you're not able to help, it could start to hurt you a little bit and like, hey, this person said they were going to help and they're just never available. So try to have some available dates, you know, maybe more than one. And that way, you know, you can hold true to what you're offering and it'll just keep it all more positive for you. So, so have some dates lined up. Another thing I would say too is when you gain permission, and this is, um, this is after you gain permission, so offer help. I mean, you could offer help before, but I'll just write this down. Oops. Um, another thing, though, is um, offer some deer meat. I had a guy once who um, I knocked on his door. Actually, it was through someone else. Somebody else knew this guy and said, you should go talk to so-and-so. And this is a big thing. I'm just going to write on here now that I'm mentioning it, but actually it doesn't go in this column, but I'll just write it down here. Network, network. And that's a huge thing. So this lady, I knew this lady through church and I was asking her about hunting near her house and she's like, oh, I know so-and-so. And so she told me where the person lived. I went and knocked on the door. I said, hey, Mrs. So-and-so said she knew you and that you might possibly allow me to hunt here. The guy's like, oh yeah, you know what? I used to hunt. I got a tree stand out there. I haven't hunted in years. I just don't have time anymore. Guy ran his own business. He gave me permission to hunt as often as I wanted. And I said, hey, if I get something, do you want some of the meat? And he's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So I ended up getting a deer. I ended up bringing him like 20 pounds of meat. And um, I'll tell you what, that guy was super excited. And I always do that when I get permission to hunt someone's land. Uh, even if I don't harvest a deer on their land, I bring them deer meat from what my other harvests. And so they love it. I have a lot of homeowners that I don't really even hunt their land anymore. And I still bring them deer meat. And they, they're so appreciative of it. And so... That's another thing. As soon as you get that permission, hey, be like, hey, um, would you like any of the deer meat? I'd love to share it with you. And here's another, I'm just going to erase network for a second here. Um, here's an important thing that I recommend is ask, what's the best place to park? Best parking place. Because now you're going on their land, you're kind of an inconvenience in a certain sense. And so you want to be the least amount of inconvenient as possible. So, Mr. So-and-so, listen, I don't want to get in your way at all anytime I'm here. Where is the best place for me to park where I am not in your way at all? And sometimes there won't be that place. And I've had landowners say, just leave your keys in the ignition. And of course, that made me a little bit nervous. So maybe we worked out a deal where, all right, how about I leave my keys and this location, uh, just I'd feel a little more comfortable than just leaving them in the ignition while I'm here and stuff like that. But you might come across that. You might have uh, landowners who that's their preference. And if you know, that's up to you then. You know, are you comfortable enough to leave your key with them? So best place to park, that's going to really help you stay out of the way. Um, let's see what else I have here. So now after, after, let's talk about how much time I have. Okay. After, after, and this means after the deer season is over, and I mentioned like relationships earlier, this is an important thing. I mean, you don't just want to be a user. You don't want to just use the person's property. You want to get, in my opinion, you want to get to know them. You want to care about them because it's all about, that's what it's all about. When it's all said and done, all that really matters in the end, all that we take with us when we go is our relationships. And, um, and so if you're nice to them, that's going to go a long way. I mean, there's been times where I've gained permission to hunt a property and I've sent them Christmas cards and, and things like that, brought in the deer meat. Um, so, you know, stay in touch. Remember the guy I talked to you about who was home and, you know, broke the collarbone and I stayed and talked to him for like an hour and a half. 
I stayed in touch with that guy for years. I would periodically call him on the phone and just be like, hey, how you doing? Anything new? What's going on? I mean, I talked to him through all kinds of things. You know, he's like, oh, I just bought a fix and flip property. You know, we're over there working on it right now. It's, it's been a money pit. It's been worse than we expected, blah, blah, blah. And I was there, some guy from another state, you know, through the journey, he got to share his frustrations with me on the phone and, and things like that. So it's, you're in it for the long haul. You're in it, the relationship, you know, for the long haul and staying in touch is a big part of that. And even to this day, if I wanted to go hunt that guy's property, I could pick up the phone and be like, hey, do you mind if I come? And I actually stopped hunting there because he got more dogs and they weren't chained or collared and they just they just chased all the deer out of there. So um, anyway, we're getting to the part where it's time for me to turn it over and take your questions. So if you have a question, go to Sean's Outdoor Adventures on YouTube and I'm going to walk over here. We're going to bring it back over this way and maybe bring it down a smidge and I will sit here on my stool and pick up my computer and see if I have any questions. Um, looks like there's some people talking about different stuff. Uh, I don't see any questions here near the bottom of the feed. If anyone has one, go ahead and fire it away. Looks like, I mean, it's like chat central over here, these guys. Okay, let's see. Would it be okay to barter for permission? Um, yeah, I, I would say absolutely. And one thing you want to do is, um, you know, build a rapport with the person in the conversation. You know, when I was saying before about, you know, factoring as much time as possible, you know, just try to ease your way into the conversation. It doesn't have to be a fast paced conversation at all. Be like, yeah, you know, and I'm just trying to gain some permission to hunt in the area so I don't have to drive so far after work and, you know, just let the conversation go. Maybe something will come up and you talk a little bit. If the person's a little bit on the fence, be like, hey, you know, um, I'm a mechanic. Uh, if you ever have an issue on the car, maybe I'll, I could help you out with that if you let me hunt your land. And, um, you know, that kind of thing can go a long way. This isn't exactly a barter situation, but I have a good friend of mine, actually, John Ortlieb. Uh, those of you who have really followed my videos know who I'm talking about, or I also mentioned them in my book. Um, but they had horses, and they were getting rid of the horses, and so they were taking their horse fence down. It was like a wooden fence, and they were, you know, taking it down in their front of their property. And while they were doing that, some people nearby were going down the road on their horses, and they saw it. And so John's wife was like, hey, do you guys want the fence? And they were like, wow, because, you know, that could be a, quite a bit of money for one of those fences. And um, so they ended up giving him the fence. So when John helped bring the fence over to the guy's property, John's looking around. He's like, oh, man, this is this is awesome here. He's like, hey, does anybody hunt here? He's like, no, nope, no, nope, nobody hunts here at all. The guy didn't let anybody hunt there ever. And John was like, well, hey, man, do you mind if I come here a little bit in the fall and, you know, do a little bow hunting? And the guy ended up giving him permission. I ended up shooting a deer on video on that property. John had a lot of good bucks on that property. Um, and then later on, you know, he just, he lost the, the permission years later. But the point is, um, his generosity offering something of his is what really opened the door. So bartering could actually be a, a very good way to help get permission. Okay, looks like I got some questions popping up now. Should you get permission in writing? Absolutely. Some states um, actually, it's a law in like Maryland. You have to have written permission. So if the person is good for giving you permission, say, look, I just really like to, you know, play everything by the book and, and, you know, be real careful about everything. Do you mind just giving me a written permission? And if, you know, you might even want to have a prefabricated permission and you can even say, look, just in case I was going to get permission, I, I wrote this up real quick. I typed it up. You know, and it just is, say, states that you give me permission to hunt here and you can just sign it. Just I just wanted to make it easy for you. And I didn't know if you were going to give me permission, but just in case I wanted to be prepared. And they might appreciate that. Also, if they're on the fence and this gets into the written stuff, um, one of the things you may want to do is get liability insurance for this type of a project or hobby or whatever. I actually had to get it um, this year as well. But, how, you know, if the person's a little on the fence, just be like, and just so you know, sir, I have liability insurance coverage 
and um, and it, you can even get them put on the policy for that particular property if they want. It's not much at all to have them added on, um, but that covers you. You know, then they don't have to worry about you getting hurt on their property and then you suing them or something like that because you're covered under your insurance. So um, that would be another thing I would strongly consider if you're trying to get permission. And here's another thing I meant to throw in while I was over there. Have some money in your pocket, not, not literally, but like budget. Let's say I have, I don't know, I'll make it up a number. Let's say I have $500 to play with and the person's a little bit on the fence that could be something too. Like, sir, well, listen, I, I really appreciate you letting me, you know, even thinking about me coming. Um, could I offer you something like um, a little, a little fee for getting on your property? Like I have 500 bucks that I can, that I can give, you know, and you can consider sort of like a lease type of a thing. And you know, you can, you can maybe negotiate and get your way in with something like that. I know leases typically go for more than that, but obviously you have to figure out where you know what the situation is that you're you're dealing with what time of day oh where did that go i had a question there and i saw it said no it just jumped off the screen here uh there was a question about what time of day do i recommend and i say like my two times that i would typically go is in the evening after most people are finished dinner but before it's dark it would be a good time definitely when it's light out but midday on a weekend, like a Saturday, Saturdays are, are best. Like Sundays, you know, I don't like to bother people a whole lot, you know, just in case they're doing family things on Sundays. So Sundays are a good a good day to avoid, in my opinion, but maybe that's the only day you have. But midday is usually a good thing because, you know, after that lunchtime, but before dinner, somewhere in there is a good time. Definitely want to do it during daylight if you can. Um, how do you feel about sending letters before knocking on the door? You can try that. It's not as personal. And, um, you know, if you're addressing it to their name, again, it gets back to that thing where you've done a little research on them before going there. And I mean, you know, some people might not be bothered with that. And like even um, this p past week, Onyx Maps, um, I was talking to them on the phone. They're actually going to be hooking up the guys from the Map Reading Challenge this year with the, the map program. And um, I was playing with it on my phone and I zoomed in on my house and you could see my name there. It shows you the property boundaries and the person's name and all that. So, I mean, it's so easy to get that kind of information anymore, but you just have to be careful. I mean, some people might be used to it. I mean, out in the Midwest, that might, I don't, I don't know because I don't live out in the Midwest. They might be more accustomed to getting those types of requests and letters. East Coast, Pennsylvania, that's not a real common thing, I don't think. And... I don't know. It, you, you could hurt your chances. It could help you, but it could also hurt you. So that's, you're going to have to just judge what are the people like in the area that I live and is that something that would be positive for them or negative? My personal opinion is you're better off with that interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction, learning their name from them, let them give it to you and, and starting it off that way. That's just my opinion. Now, I, I mean, again, it can be, um, it can be, different for different areas. Let's see if I can find another question on here. Um, let's see. I am not seeing it. I'm sure there's questions. Okay. Where do you get insurance from? Okay. Um, actually, um, the insurance that I got from is, I don't even know where they, I think they're located in like North Carolina. You could probably Google like liability insurance for sports or hobbies and see what comes up and, um, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff on the internet, but you basically want to call, you can even call some local brokers too and tell them what you're doing. Like I have a local broker, uh, insurance broker here. Um, when I originally was trying to get on local channels to have a TV show, a hunting show on local channels, just the local cable, they, they wanted me to have um, media liability insurance. So I went to all the insurance carriers and they were like, what, you know? And that wasn't something they were very familiar with, so I had a hard time. But my point is, the uh, local carriers had all these different types of insurances that they were ready to offer me, but they didn't have that one available. Because that was really, media liability insurance is more designed for your big, like, movie production companies and, and big time TV. So they weren't really willing to work with a small time guy, you know, and that's why I didn't end up doing that, so... Um, do you just see property you would like to hunt and knock on the door? Does this only work for small properties? Um, yeah, that's one, that's really what I, 
I mean, I drive around and say, okay, I'd really like to hunt here. And this is especially when I was younger, we would try to hunt on properties that we could get to more easily, like, you know, when I was a teenager and stuff. And, you know, I would just, I knew where the areas were that I wanted to hunt, and I would just go knock on the door. So, absolutely, that's kind of my, um, my take. And it, it, could, it didn't matter the size of the property. There was one old guy that we got permission to hunt, me and Scott. Scott's also in some of my old videos and my book. And we just went and knocked on this old guy's door, and he was, like, in his 90s, lived by himself, farmer. He owned, like, I don't know, 100 acres in this area there. Gave us permission to hunt there. And it was no problem. We just stayed in touch with the guy. But then there's also properties. I had permission in, on a property to hunt in Maryland when I was down there. It was a four-acre property. So, I mean, it, the, it could be anything. You just It all depends on the, you know, your interaction with the person and what they're willing to do. So I would say don't let the size of the property deter you from giving it a try. Um, let's see. Anything else? Looks like I've answered most of the questions that have popped up near the bottom here. So I guess I can wrap it up um, here. And first of all, um, next week I was thinking about talking about, um, you know, in my basement here I have, you know, racks and, and these racks over on the wall here. Uh, looking at a, a deer's rack isn't always the best way to judge age, although it can be helpful. But next week I thought about talking about some deer management ideas going into the season. Uh, a lot of people's seasons have already started, but a lot of people like myself in Pennsylvania doesn't start till the end of this month, beginning of October. This week, I'm actually going to run down for a day in Maryland and see if I can do any good. But um, anyway, the whole idea of management, you know, how do we handle the doe population? And, and when we're looking at a buck, should I shoot? Should I let it walk? That's always a big question. And again, it's usually body size that you want to learn. And I... I don't have a bunch of uh, uh, live mounted deer to use as examples, so on a live feed, there's a little bit of a challenge there. But I can talk about some of the racks that I have here and how that fits into you know age brackets for deer. I mean, there are general tendencies for ages of deer. You know, like I mean, this was a four and a half year old buck. They're usually just out a little bit out past the tips of their ears. This was. You know, about a three or four year old buck. Three year old bucks are usually right around the tip. But those are things I can kind of talk about as far as making a judgment. Um, again, rack isn't the best thing, but I might do that next week. I haven't made a final decision. Feel free to email me this week if you have a different topic. I had an email this past week I could also incorporate next week. Um, he, the guy he has a bunch of children like I do, and he's like, how do you manage your time with your family and hunting? So I might bring that in next week. Oh, and I have a couple minutes. I did want to address the map reading challenge. I just remembered. So the map reading challenge, if you've been following that whole thing, I've got 12 hunters, four teams of three, and um, they're fighting for some grand prizes. You know, the team with the highest overall score is going to get an XOP Air Raid tree stand. The individual with the highest score is going to get a brand new Bowtech Rain 6. And one of the viewers is going to get one of each of those as well. The voting, the, like, to get the Bowtech, the viewer, um, you're going to have to vote for one of the guys. And I haven't given all the information to Bowtech yet because they want to build the website for this. So when you go on there, you register and vote... Um, your name goes into the lottery, and I believe, you know, the last I talked to them, they want to make it so you can vote once a day, if that's what you want to do for the duration of the period, um, but you still only get your name in the mix one time. So if you go and vote every day, what you're doing is helping that guy potentially win, because that's going to add to his total score, but still your name is in the, in the lottery one time. As far as I know, I'll have to verify that with them, but that's that was my understanding. And um, my website, to get in the lottery for the tree stand, you have to be on my newsletter, and I'm going to send out a form when we get closer to the drawing to get everyone's name and address, because when I draw a winner, I just want to be able to ship it. I don't want to have to try to find an address at that point. I want to have it all lined up. I also want to get a phone number, because I'd, I'd love to call you live. So we're probably going to do that for the Bowtech. It's going to be a live drawing, and I'm going to call the person live and tell them they won. It's going to be a lot of fun. And... Um, so those are things. But you need to be on my newsletter. And apparently there was a glitch with my newsletter this last few days 
because the plugin that I was using for the newsletter, it updated and it was clashing with something else on the website and so it wasn't working properly, but it's working again. So if you tried to get on my newsletter and had an issue, it should be good to go again. So make sure you sign up for that. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. I will check back with you next week and I'll let you know at that time if I did any good on my hunt this weekend. And good luck to all of you who are going out hunting anytime soon. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, I got to figure out how to turn this thing off and God bless you all. Thank you so much. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless.